hello. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about building price-stable synthetic currencies with Bitcoin. So what is a price-stable synthetic currency? Oh, so price-stable synthetic currencies are actually what makes Abra able to, it's one of the primary things that allows Abra to scale to everyone in the world. Um, so that's why it's important to us, and that's why I think you'd be interested to learn about it. Um, so at Abra, we believe that uh, in financial inclusion, so we believe that everyone should have access to the financial tools that they need in order to uh, be successful and uh, survive and thrive in the world. Um, so as part of this vision, we would need to be able to offer our products to everyone in the world. So we've developed a uh, kind of a platform that's uh, non-custodial um, in contrast to most exchanges and wallet, uh, a lot of uh, um, big uh, financial tools where they're fully custodial. And so what that means is that um, we never uh, control a customer's funds. And so we can uh, deploy our products uh, to new jur jurisdictions across the world with uh, a lot less uh, legal loopholes or legal uh, hurdles that we have to jump over. And so this just allows us to go to market way faster. So in my mind, that's like one of the primary uh, benefits of these synthetic uh, uh, currencies. Um, another benefit, though, is security, because I don't, if you're familiar with the crypto space, you're familiar with some of the security problems that come with having these centralized custodial exchanges that get hacked and are like a huge target for hackers. Um, so this is uh, our portfolio view in our app. As you can see, it, the app looks just like a lot of uh, investment apps that you have. Um, you have various uh, assets that you can have. Uh, some of them are fiat currencies. We support 50 uh, fiat currencies, uh, roughly, um, and about 25 cryptocurrencies. Uh, and some, most of those are synthetic, and some of them are uh, native. Um, so the idea is that we We'll, we can quickly add new uh, currencies at any time, and we'll add them as a synthetic currency, and the popular ones will bring native. Um, uh, so what is a synthetic currency? So one way to think of it is it's kind of like a, like a gold fund. So when you invest in a gold fund, uh, really you're just getting exposure to gold, and you settle in and out with dollars. Um, so if you buy an ounce of gold, when the price goes up, you still have an ounce of gold. But you have more; it's worth more dollars. The price goes down. You still have an ounce of gold. But it's worth less dollars. And similarly, with our synthetic currencies, when the price goes up, it's worth more Bitcoin. The price goes down; it's worth less Bitcoin. Uh, but the currency value stays the same. So this is a, another uh, screen from our app that I wanted to show you, just to give you an idea of what our app can do. Uh, so. Uh, part of this model of being, um, uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Are you doing questions? I can ask. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, so you said the, the currency uh, value remains the same. So the, is that the fiat currency value remains the same? Yeah. The, so the synthetic currency. So it can be fiat or uh, crypto or really we could support any asset type. Um, but so part of this, uh, our model that we've developed allows us to. Uh, add uh, exchange partners or banking partners throughout the world so we can have different cash in and cash out methods depending on the jurisdiction. So uh, that also allows us to uh, go to market a lot faster. Um, so now is the time when I was going to take questions about how Abra works. Any, any questions? Yeah, go for it. Is this just a bunch or how are you making these currencies? Oh, what was the question? Are you using like, some sort of like bunch or type of method? Or? Oh no! So it's it's literally uh, on the phone there. The, the, the so we have a, a price that we give a, 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 a currency like Ethereum or whatever, and then on the phone it's backed by Bitcoin. And so in, in the original title it was Bitcoin and Litecoin. Really, we could do this with any currency, um, uh, but uh, I'm just for simplicity in the talk. I'm just going to say Bitcoin. So currently we support Bitcoin, Litecoin, or Bitcoin Cash, but for various reasons most of our assets are backed by Bitcoin. Currently, um, and I will go into details on exactly how this works. Do you have integration for merchants? Or is it oh, so uh, Abra had multiple iterations. 
So in our beginning, we were a remittance space. Uh, that was kind of our use case that we were trying to solve as remittances, which is being able to send money from one country to another. And as part of that model, we did develop a merchant uh, app. But currently, we really want to focus on what's working, which is most people in the crypto space really just want to invest in cryptos. So that's our focus now. So but in the, in the future, we may bring back our merchant app. But you currently do not have any? No, we're not. No. Any more questions? The value of my synthetic or the fiat currency remains the same. Um, am I investing in it for returns? Um, yeah, so if you wanted exposure to uh, whatever it might be, Ethereum or uh, Stellar or whatever, then you would move your money into uh, that currency. And then on your phone, it's stored in, in Bitcoin. And so when the price goes up, Avera is basically, uh, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make it whole for that amount. And I'll, I'll go into that now. Yeah. Now, because we're non-custodial, in most places, we do not have to be a money service business. So, so do they have them, or do they not have them? Uh, we, we are pursuing them just so we have it, but we don't need to have it. Yes, so we actually yeah. have a legal team that's on top of that, so we are registered as a research service in SP, um, but they not Oh, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on the exact uh, stage of it. But the point is that with this uh, technology, it would not be necessary. So let me go into a little more details on how it works. Um, so say our typical user, Alice, wants to deposit $100 into Abra. The current Bitcoin price is $100. So that's quite a steal right now. Uh, so Al Alice would transfer her $100 to one of, uh, one of Avra's exchange partners, where that $100 would get converted into one Bitcoin, and then that Bitcoin would get sent to the phone, Alice's uh, app. Uh, meanwhile, because Avra needs to maintain this, we call it a hedge, uh, I'll explain what that is, um, Avra will borrow one Bitcoin from our lender, uh, and then exchange that Bitcoin for $100, and now Avra ends up with $100 in their bank account, and Alice has one Bitcoin on her phone, and I've uh, molded those, those numbers so remember them, because they will not change as the price changes. And that's kind of how this works. Um, so now, let's say the price of Bitcoin goes up to $200, uh, and now Alice wants to withdraw her money. So uh, the, the app would uh, transfer that, hundred, that one Bitcoin on her phone, uh, and half of the Bitcoin would go to the exchange partner, where it can then be sold for $100, and that $100 gets into Alice's uh, bank or wherever. Uh, meanwhile, the other half of Bitcoin goes to Abra. Abra has $100, which is not only worth half of Bitcoin, but they can exchange that um, for half of Bitcoin, and with the other half of Bitcoin, they have a full Bitcoin that they can return to their lender. So everyone's happy. But what if the price went down? So now, the Bitcoin on Alice's app is uh, it's worth only $50. Um, so it gets, gets uh, sent to the exchange partner. Um, that's not enough to make the $100 that, Aber need, or that Alice needs. So Aber provides the other half Bitcoin, and that now, she has a, the, now there's a, uh, the, the other Bitcoin, I'm sorry. So now there's two Bitcoins that they can sell for $100 sent to Alice. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Abra will uh, use the hundred dollars to exchange for two Bitcoin. One of the Bitcoins went to Alice. The other Bitcoin goes back to the lender. So everyone's happy. So does that make it more clear? Yeah. So that's basically. So a hedge has several different meanings for different people. So for when I talk about hedge, I'm talking about this specifically. And what it's doing is it's uh, Abra is hedging the risk, but but it's also just pegging the value of the Bitcoin or on, the, on Alice's phone to the asset that she wants. But also, sorry. No, no, go for it. So you know, it seems like you're uh, providing a hedge for Alice. Yeah, so we are providing a hedge in the traditional sense. But I, I will talk about a hedge contract. And that, that hedge contract is that contract between Alice and uh, Abra to peg the value of the Bitcoin on her phone to, uh, 
to whatever the asset is. So it's kind of a two-way hedge in a way because it, 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 it could pay out to Alice, it could pay out to Ever. Yeah? So uh, two questions. So what exactly does Alice want to do? Does she want to buy Bitcoin? Why is she using the Abra app? You know, why is she putting in? What is she trying to do out of it? Yeah, so mainly uh, the main use case for Abra right now is uh, investing, right? Okay. It's, so she wants it's, to invest it's for in retail investors. It, no, it could be any, any of the uh, assets or currencies that we support. So we support 25 cryptos okay. currently, and then, relatively. Uh, I guess the second part is like, how does Abra make money in this entire sort of transaction? Oh, we just charge a, a spread on, on the exchanges when you exchange a currency, similar to most exchanges. So this step one there says, Alice starts with one BTC on our app. Is our app showing or one BTC or is it showing for one? Shows her the one hundred dollars. So the point is that she has a hundred dollars coming, so yeah. not that she has one. BTC. Yeah, this is showing more just kind of the back end how it works. So it's all unknown to Alice. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we don't necessarily hide it from you if you're a technical user. You can dig into the blockchain and look at what your keys are and where your money is. But but yeah, we try to make we're we're, we're uh, targeting like retail investors aren't necessarily sophisticated. Just giving them a, a way to get exposure to cryptocurrencies. Yep. You were saying that the, the BTC is on Alice's phone, but to keep the price stable, you're moving BTC around. Yeah. So when she does a transaction, she may the 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 app will move the Bitcoin around. So it doesn't it doesn't it only re uh, readjusts the uh, the values when a transaction is done. Yeah, withdrawing. We we have. I'm going through um, withdraw and deposit because they're common transactions. We support lots of different types. Yeah. So I think I get that the app has Alice's key, but does Alice see her key? Um. So we don't currently have a way for you to. Well, so you can get a. The app allows you to have a. You have a backup phrase similar to most uh, crypto wallets, and so from that you can theoretically get all your keys. But we don't, currently there's not an easy way for her to get it. That's something we will do in the future. But she could potentially send that BTC wherever she wants. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'll get to that next. That's what I'm talking about next. Yep. So does she have the transaction that's occurring? She's downloaded the transaction, which is why you, you don't need the money servicing license? So no, no, the reason we don't need a money servicing license is because we never touch her money. So the transactions have so she, she's doing the transaction in, exchange, uh, in partnership with our partner, who's an exchange. She does have a license. How does she find a partner who's willing to do the? That all happens automatically through the app. Your app is finding that partner. Yeah. So when she connects her bank or whatever, then she's really creating an account on the exchange. Yes. Uh, so the, currently, uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and BCH, we can do this process with. Yeah. Sorry, can you speak a little louder? No, no, it all happens automatically by the app. This is just talking about how the app functions. Can you repeat the question? Oh, he was asking, uh, like, uh, I guess if the user needs to look up the the transaction details in order to do this. Yeah. yeah, that's all stored in the app as part of the app details. Are you guys covering Slipbridge on some of the less like liquid pants? Yeah, so Slipbridge is definitely a problem. Uh, it's kind of a little bit, a little bit more complicated than I was going to address in this topic. This is more about the technology behind the Bitcoin smart contract, uh, not so much the financial side of it. But uh, yes, so basically what Aver does is has a, has a fee that they charge, which would cover those, those details. So we may lose money on one transaction and make it up on another, for example. All right. So this is kind of what it looks like from the Bitcoin transaction level. So in order to pre prevent Alice, from, I forget who asked the question, but someone was saying if Alice has access to the keys, can't she just withdraw the Bitcoin? If, it's worth more than her hedge. Um, so the way we prevent that is use a two of two multi-sig transaction, or multi-sig uh, uh, UTXO. And the, 
So one of the keys in the multisig is Alice's, the other key is Abra's, and now both Alice and Abra have to agree in order to spend that UTXO. Um, so that's basically a, um, basically prevents Alice from going outside of the app to spend the, the hedge. Um, so as you can see, uh, so a hedge contract then uh, is incorporated by both the UTXO and some details about the hedge, which we store in our database as well as get stored on Alice's phone. Um, one thing to note too about uh, our transactions is a typical Bitcoin transaction is usually two inputs and one output. They're all kind of different, but generally it's one input from, uh, or, sorry, I said it's one input and two outputs, one input from the sender, one output to the recipient, and then one output which is changed back to the sender. And for Abra, we typically might think of it as having two inputs and three outputs because there's now an extra input from Abra in order to make up for any, anything that the hedge needs, and then Abra might get changed. Also, Abra might need to get paid out. Um, so that's basically how we do it with 202. Yeah. Just a fundamental question. Does uh, the sequence of signatures matter in uh, Does it matter? No, not really. I mean, it not generally, it does not matter. With regard to the, what if Abra goes under, let's say, what's the time lock? Good question. So there's no time lock, but I will talk about what happens if Abra goes under. So in this model, what we would do, so this is actually how we currently do it, and it works really well. Um, there is an improvement, which is what I'm going to get to next, um, which we are planning. But currently what we would do is just publish our public keys. So then, so then Alice, you need, we need, you need some sort of tool to do it, but Alice would be able to get her funds. No, or sorry, sorry, we publish our private keys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So does the user end up creating an account the exchange? Or the app creates the the account on the exchange, yeah, the user does it through like some form. It's like they, depending on the exchange, there'll be different sign up. Uh, so the, yeah. the, depending on the jurisdiction and the and the, uh, the exchange they're going through, yeah. So uh, quickly, what is the advantage of this app against the user is creating a I'm sorry, I have a time hard time here. What is the value added? Oh, so the main value in my mind is that it allows us to go live everywhere. We're live in pretty much every country that doesn't have, you know, sanctions like North Korea. Or, um, so, and then the, she doesn't necessarily need to go through KYC if she's not going to use one of the exchange partners. So you can get money from another average user. Um, we have a way to use uh, cash in and cash out that's live in the Philippines. Uh, potentially, we'd be able to have more stuff like that in more countries. Yeah. Uh, in this diagram, what is the what is the pay to public key tax for? I was paying into a, a should never be paying to two of you or Okay, so um, the, the arrows are just like kind of who owns that UTXO. Oh. So Abra is paying into the transaction. So it's coming from our hot wallet to make up for if there's like uh, the hedges, you know, less than the value of the, so the, uh, the synthetic the currency. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we talked about what are some of the limitations of 202. Um, there, there's two primary ones. One is uh, what happens if uh, if uh, so if the price of Bitcoin skyrockets, which it sometimes does. Um, the user is not necessarily going to come back to the app anytime soon, but Avro will have all of these all this value locked up in these UTXOs, and that value is actually belongs to Abra, or it really belongs to our lender, and Abra's paying interest on it. So it's not ideal. Um, so it'd be nice if Abra could roll over the hedges without the need of the user. And the other one that you talked about is like if Abra goes away, like how can the user get their funds? Um, so we can solve both of these problems by using a, a two of three model, where we have the third key is owned by a neutral party, uh, an oracle, that uh, knows how to execute the contract rules and can do that in a fairly secure way, such that both Alice and Abra can trust that they'll do it correctly. Um, yeah, so as you can see, this transaction is very similar to the 2 of 2 one, 
difference that you use two or three multi-sig and UTXOs, and we're going to hash the contract details into the UTXO. So that way, when the Oracle goes to sign the uh, transaction, um, the a user or abber can just provide the contract details, the transaction to be signed, and then the Oracle can uh, verify that that contract represents that UTXO. Yeah, so this is kind of what the uh, kind of architecture, higher level architecture of what an Oracle would look like. Um, there's two main pieces to it. There's one which is the, uh, the contract rules validator, uh, and then there's a price feed. Both of these need to be designed in such a way that everyone can trust them. So the price feed takes in uh, different data from different places like exchanges, uh, kind of well-trusted uh, price feeds, um, which are, there are several now. Um, and then aggregates them in such a way that, uh, that it, it can be pretty sure that it's a fair price. Um, and then the rules validator is just some fairly simple open source rules for reading the transaction and the, uh, the, uh, the contract and just validating that it's true. And then the user or abber can present these to the Oracle. If the Oracle agrees that it's valid, it just signs the transaction. And then now anyone can post that transaction to the blockchain. Yeah. Can you talk about the prices? Because obviously people arbitrage the prices currently across exchanges. So, I mean, how are we given that? So, we, we definitely want, uh, so there's a lot of nuances to it, but we definitely want multiple feeds for any given exchange pair. We'd want multiple feeds, and then we'll aggregate them. So, we'll average them. You can do volume weighted averaging um, so that you know, a small an exchange with small volume doesn't, you know, influence the price of a more important exchange. And then you can throw out anomalies and things like that. Um, and then, and we, so there'll probably be some fee associated with going through the Oracle, to, just to pay for the Oracle, but that would also uh, prevent people from wanting to use that for arbitrage. And at that point, like if there was, really was an arbitrage opportunity, I mean, as long as the price was valid, then I mean, there shouldn't really be one, but um, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what the transaction would look like for a rollover. So you have Alex's, uh, Alice's two of three UTXO, but this, that one would be signed by both Abra and the Oracle, not Alice. And then, um, since Alice is not available, we would just roll it over to her same address again, and um, and then Abra would get the leftover. And then this is uh, the other way where Alice wants to withdraw funds. So in this case, in order to get the address for Abra, um, the, that would have to be included in the, uh, the contract details. We didn't go over exactly what would be in contract details, but it's just simple stuff and you could add more depending on the rules, but it's like, you know, the price, the asset, um, the, the price would be the open price of the contract and then withdraw addresses or another important thing. Yeah? So, oh, so in two or three, if you lose your key, it seems like someone can sort of siphon out individual user accounts like one by one in the Oracle went down, right? It's like, not like someone reports it to you. Like if someone steals the key? Yeah. Uh, from the Oracle or from Abra or the user? You. <laughs> or the user, but like, you know, they can steal like their master key, you know, find some big accounts, slowly like cipher it out. Yeah. You know. So, I mean, but isn't that a problem in any transaction? Well, but so it's just that this isn't exactly non custodial, right? Well, I mean, it, I don't know. Like, you, it, there, there's some risk of the hacking, right? Hacking of the Oracle. Well, yeah, <laughs> but th those are true. There is risk of, of things getting hacked, but I feel like that's true in any model. Well, but if, you know, you have your own hardware ledger wall, it's like you're totally responsible for it. Here, whereas if you put your money in Avra, there is still risk that like the other party you gets hacked. Did I, can I, well, you need, yeah, we'd have to have two parties. <laughs> yeah. You have to steal both keys in order to get the file. No, you can steal the, uh, their key and pretend to be them in the Oracle, right? No, but the, the Oracle, would, yeah, but they wouldn't get the money. It would go to the user's address. So, 
But if it's just Bitcoin, can't you just send it? No, because the Oracle will only execute according to the rules. No, but it's stolen. It's yeah. stolen. No, if, but if they stole Avar's key, then, or, then they submit it to the Oracle, like in this case, and they pretend to be Avar, it's going back to Alice's address. So I got already in Alice's address. Yeah, you have to have two keys, right? So you have yeah. to steal either the customer's key and Avar's key, or you have to steal the Avar's key and the Oracle key, and that's how the 203 signature security works. But is it? But it, all right, so if you have a two three address, that's that it's some account, right? And you steal Abra's key, yeah. and so then you, you pretend to be Abra to the Oracle and say send it over to Binance. Well, no, because yeah, so you can't do that. Uh, so you can steal Abra's money depending on how we design it. So, so there's an interface to the Oracle for Abra to say I want to roll over stuff. So if you allow Abra to present the address that they want that rollover funds to go to, they could potentially steal Abra's money. But Alice's money is getting rolled over and using her own address. So I think your point is that if by just the mere possession of the private key, you can pretend to be Abra, but I doubt if that's how it works. Well, you definitely need the contract details also. <laughs> but yes, if one party gets hacked, well, so the point is though, in two of three, you need two parties to be compromised. But you're right, you could pretend to be or the Oracle. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of ways you could add like extra security, but that's, that's beyond this, this presentation. Um, so, yeah, any more questions on the actual, like, how the Oracle works? Okay, so if I'm Alice, I'm... No, I'm just going to rehash that, I guess. I'm just telling you, I mean, if I'm Alice, I'm having to trust two parties, so my attack surface has effectively doubled. Yeah. Whereas if I'm trying to solve the problem of we're going under, why not having there, you can have more complex scripts. Yeah. So we can talk about trust. So yeah, there's the, uh, <laughs> so trust of course is in the Oracle is really important. So basically Alice needs to trust that Abra and the Oracle aren't gonna collude, right? That's her main thing. But notice that the, at the worst case, if they are colluding, it's still just what a, a custodial exchange would be. Well, okay, yeah. but we're still at square one, right? No, I mean, it's not, it's not worse, right? Except that you guys aren't licensed to be a custodial exchange. Uh, well, no, but, but, we, but so the point though is you do need to trust the Oracle, right? Like, so the user would want to trust the Oracle. I mean, so I mean, we go into the ways that you add trust, but the main thing for the user though is that, um, so if we go back to the beginning, my main point was that the main value of this is that it allows you to go live in uh, faster. So, I mean, and of course, Avera and the Oracle do not plan on uh, colluding. And so the point is for us to set up these two organizations in such a way that it's hard to collude and that there's no reason to collude and we, we don't have any reason to collude. So, uh, nice segue, yeah. not having a reason to collude. Avera has its own key yeah. and it controls the app. It writes yeah. the app. So yeah. there is no reason to collude. I would spend all of everybody's time. Yeah, if we, if we wanted to <laughs> screw over users, we can. Like, <laughs> That's even a blender, even in the hardware box. But the way around that is to, uh, is to make it an open procedure in how the app works and let people audit it. The same with any, any app, right? Any app you, you use, is, you kind of have to trust or audit. So the ways to trust the Oracle, though, so first of all, you design the Oracle in such a way as to minimize the trust, right? So if, if you noticed in our diagram, we really want to focus on the price view to make sure that that's going to give us accurate prices because that's super important. And then focus on the, uh, the rule validating part because we want to make sure that that's following the rules. Um, so, and then meanwhile, we'll also add auditing and monitoring. So you can always audit the, uh, the price feed to make sure that, uh, you know, at any time, make sure it's giving you the right prices. You can also audit the whole system by providing it with a transaction and seeing that it signs it correctly, and then you don't necessarily have to post that to the blockchain. Um, and then you also monitor the blockchain. And so since these have the hashes hashed into the UTXOs, you can actually, if you know the original contract details, you can make sure that it's getting executed correctly. Um, so of course you want to minimize complexity in any security system. Uh, but we, for the rules validator, we'd open source it. Um, and then share, well, for all of the Oracle code, you probably open source it so that it can be audited 
and then you run the rules validator in an SGX enclave, which is basically a special kind of chip where you can run signed code, and then from outside you can uh, you can uh, validate that the code was that, that, that you think is running is actually running there. Um, and then in the future, you, you probably want to use multiple oracles, so you can say if you had five oracles and you need three of them to agree that the rules are getting executed correctly, then uh, then that's a lot better than just one, and you can have them all run in different jurisdictions. Uh, and you, you do this through something called Shamir Secret Cert Sharing, which basically allows, uh, it's kind of like two or three, but there, there could be only one key that the oracle shares between five, five oracles. And then to get to the point of like having the users fully trust the oracle, uh, I think the best way for that to happen is if there, in the future, there could be uh, companies that uh, kind of specialize in this. So they would have, um, you know, the the proper like uh, arbitration uh, in 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 place, and then like a surety bond. So if, if they break their agreement, like someone can get paid out for their damages, etc. Any more questions? Have you considered doing this with something like? Have you considered doing this with something like smart contracts, so people don't need to? Trust that you're just doing the right thing, like a like a Ethereum style smart contract. Mm -hmm. Any, anything that operates in public view. So this is like a smart contract. So you could do it with Ethereum or Rootstock or one of these other systems, but uh, you still are really need to rely on the price feeds, which are external feeds. So you still are going to end up with an Oracle, anyways. Yes. I mean, who do you, do you see like DY DX is like your so they're like a decentralized uh, derivatives. De decentralized derivatives. So in terms of decentralized exchanges, we, we will plug into them. Do you, see, do you see specific people doing der decentralized derivatives as your? No, no, because they're like the one of our exchange partners. So they're just another exchange partner we can use. So we're trying to build a platform that makes it really easy for people to plug into the crypto investing space and not have to like use all these different tools to like. You know, go to one exchange to buy one token and download it and put on their ledger wallet and uh, then move it to another exchange to sell it, et cetera. So you can do it all in one place. Yeah. So the synthetic dollar is a dollar backed by Bitcoin. And, the, and it's like these dollar coins that are in the wallet or the actual Bitcoin? It's, it's Bitcoin plus these contract details. Not the synthetic thing. The, that, uh, the synthetic coin is Bitcoin plus the contract details. So, huh. okay, so if the uh, if Bitcoin went to like zero, right? Yeah. What would happen? So that's the one case that's hard to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> if it goes to one cent, if it goes to one cent, we're fine. Right. Or, I mean, I think basis has this problem, too. I don't think it's just zero. Yeah. I think if there's, like, a map, a, like, massiveness. Yeah, I can talk about the advantages of basis or one of those other, like, yeah, uh, I think, well, I think maker down. Well, basically, well, and the other problem they have is they, they're only going to support currencies and, and assets that have a market, right, on basis. We can support almost anything that has a, a reliable price seat. Uh, yeah, but only if it goes like a. It's never going to go zero. Not zero, but like, what if it was at like a thousand? That's fine. Yeah, because we're hedged. We, I mean, we, or then we owe our. We can buy back what we owe our lender for a lot less. Um, I have a question. So, over here, right, it's like Alice deposits $100, and the next slide, if she's withdrawing, and she withdraws like $200 at that point, because the value of Bitcoin has like doubled at that stage. Oh, but so she has a hundred dollars in her app. I, yeah, so, so she, she can't. So her app would not let her withdraw up to hundred dollars. No, but but the thing is that she's she's putting this hundred dollars in to buy Bitcoin. Oh, so she she switches. And, and the value of Bitcoin increases. Yeah. And she's withdrawing all of it. Out. So Bitcoin in our app is native. So if she switches to Bitcoin, it's just like a Bitcoin wallet. Okay. If she switches to another synthetic coin like uh, 
like whatever Dogecoin, and then then it works the same way as with dollars, except instead of uh, exchanging our Bitcoin for dollars, we exchange our Bitcoin for Dogecoin, and then we hold Dogecoin. Uh, I want to let Ish continue the presentation. Yeah. So, oops, wrong way. We'll yeah, there's one more part to it, which is kind of uh, just kind of this is the main uh, kind of concept, but. Okay. Last year, some things changed, so I, we uh, improved on it a little okay. bit. Um, so the main two changes were one, minor fees became a big issue. Uh, the other, um, so originally we were more of like a remittance kind of system. We also did merchant payments, but it was more about sending money from one person to another. Now we're much more focused on retail investors. So with retail investors, most of our transaction types are just, they're just changing from one asset class to another. So. If you think about it, the UTXO is, is, is the value is not changing much when you go from Dogecoin to you know, uh, 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 Ethereum Classic or whatever. Um, so, you know, there might be a little bit taken out for average fee, or you know, over time the prices might see a little bit, but the basic value stays the same. So, a lot of our transaction types are these uh, change currency types, and if they happen. And, and, and often they're not, we're not making much, there's no reason to actually spend it because we were spending a lot on the mining fee. And there was no, no place where we were able to make much profit. Um, so then I, we came up with this idea of hedge amendments. So if you can actually amend the hedge that's in the UTXO, then um, you can just say, well, this was, let's see my example, it was 500 USD, USD but now I'm changing it to 1,000 stellar. Uh, so why, I don't need to spend the actual UTXO. Alice and Aver can just agree that that's what they're doing, sign the contract, and then submit that to the Oracle. And then the Oracle can just keep track of all of the contracts. And then when it comes time to spend the UTXO, it can just check all the contracts to see if it's valid. Um, so you can keep on doing this and chaining them along uh, until it becomes economically advantageous to send the UTXO. Like for example, if there's more value and then you take so uh, if it's worth actually cashing it out. So these are completely off chain? This part of it. So the UTXO is on chain. So you would, basically you get to decide if it's a change currency and, the, and the, the, the actual value is staying with the same person, then the, the app can optimize for when it makes sense to actually go on chain versus just keep track of the amendments. Before you ask the question, just read the <laughs> Sorry. And so, one of the so this is kind of what the Oracle service now would look like. So it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so we need to persist some data now. So you persist uh, the data about the contracts. The reason for that is because you need to invalidate the previous contracts. Otherwise, someone might redeem something in the past that's worth more. Um, and then you also have to to really make it uh, like ensure that the contract's valid you would have to check the blockchain to make sure that the UTXO is But uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same. Now, I think that's, that's the last thing. So now you can ask any question you want. <laughs> Over here. Wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. Are you guys hiring? Uh, yes. You have to ask that to that guy. <laughs> All right, who are you hiring for? <laughs> We're uh, hiring for developers, blockchain experts. Come to me if you want a job. And you are? I'm Willie. I work at Avra. I run product. And you just can't wait to hire everybody in the room. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Willie. <laughs> yep. So with the, the, the contracts and the off-chain update, it kind of sounds like the way that Lightning contracts work, right? You have, you, with, oh. you're changing the balances, right? So you're changing sort of who's getting what if this is settled. Is that right? Uh, I, I don't think it's very similar to Lightning. It's similar in that you're uh, kind of it's an off-chain way of avoiding going to on-chain until you want to. But, um, but the, when you dig into the details, it doesn't have... Uh, what, what does the, this contract look like programmatically? Oh, it's just JSON. It's just JSON? Yeah. Like, like with what fields? So there's uh, the, the asset that's okay. getting uh, contracted on the opening price. Um, the, those, those are the main ones. And then the withdrawal address that uh, Avra needs. 
So, you stay, so each party, so uh, rather than the customer uh, taking that JSON, sign it with a private key that is needed to release the CTXO. Are we talking about the amendments or the? Uh... I guess when you say, I mean, signing, when you sign a contract, there's signing in crypto and then there's signing contracts. So, when you say signing, I'm wondering if that's with the private key. Yeah, with private keys. keys. Yeah, the original private keys in the UTXO, so that the the uh, Oracle. I mean, there's there's a different ways you could design this, but the way I was thinking is that you'd sign it with the same private keys in the original multi sig. Yeah. Um, so the question is about oracles. Uh, something that I couldn't figure out: Do you randomize the oracles, the oracle selection? Um, that's number one, and then uh, number two. So oracles get paid uh, for the job that they're doing. Yeah. Um, do you control for the oracle becoming malicious and just creating jobs and sort of like the, uh, acting as as potentially as their own provider of high speed? Oh right, yeah. So um, yeah. So the question would be. Uh, so the first question is, like, do we randomize oracles? No, there's nothing in, about that in this design. Um, you can have multiple oracles, but then you would use any threshold number of them. Um, so there's nothing random about it. You can find whichever ones you want. Um, and then the other question is, do we handle malicious? How do we handle malicious oracles? Um, so what we would do is, is so we, we basically would have a contract with the company providing the oracles. So we wouldn't be able to invalidate all of the past UTXOs, but we'd stop using them, of course, and we might see them. <laughs> yes, but, but, but the question is not only that, that that's right, the community would flow. Um, so, right, if you catch a, what you have on something like an SLA or, or something with a company, yeah. you just terminate the contract. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, how fast can you catch them? And that they're actually malicious. I'm pretty sure we'd catch them within a day, right? Because we're constantly monitoring the activity. But, but, um, but um, they're getting paid for the providing of price fee, right? Yeah. Um, who are they providing the price fee to? Are they providing it to, the, uh, to you? They're so they get, they're getting paid to sign these transactions for Abra out of band from the user and for the user if they, so, so for some so reason, don't want to go through Abra. Won't there be a, an attack vector where a um, malicious um, oracle creates uh, a lot of users and basically creates a request for the price fee, just and then just, just generates the, these. Requests. They're not getting paid specifically for the price fee. They're getting paid to sign these transactions. So, and the the fees that they would get come from the value in those transactions. So, I mean, it's a good thing to uh, to investigate, um, but I'm pretty sure it would cost them more to create the transactions than to. Uh... Yeah. Building on top of that, <laughs> have all, I've got a lot of questions. Yeah. About that. Um, do you have a contract in place with the uh, Oracle services? No, so we were working on that, so. All right, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw out, it's easy to be called oracles.org, but you should check out PLA Network. And if there is a malicious validator signing these transactions, not providing a price fee, because I think everyone would agree a price, price fee would be very difficult for an Oracle service, but for signing a valid, uh, and validating transactions, uh, PLA Network has basically notary public so you could reach out through traditional uh, legal mechanisms should there be a malicious actor and you could then reach out using traditional legal frameworks yeah so you now so yeah I, I totally agree um, but I, but I do this these questions do raise like the, the the most tricky part of this is not the technical side it's the how do you set up this legal entity to run the Oracle oh, it's called P -A -P -O -A <laughs> that, that's what did you work with them Okay, we should talk. <laughs> so, yeah. Just something. Jen, aren't you a validator of POA? Well, I, I think I am. Yes. There you go. <laughs> so, Jen, I'm going to look at you. I mean, this is specifically regarding your like, pivot, per se. Yeah. I learned about Abra back when you guys were. Uh, focus on the remittance market. Right. Uh, why did you sort of move into this? Is it just like you felt it was more profitable, or was there sort of like regulation around like money going cross borders? Is that something you shed some light? Oh no, it totally had to do with the fact that that's where the users were. Okay. When we did the pivot, our growth went way up. So what happens when I get recode? 
Wait, I can please elaborate. <laughs> you are a non-custodial, that's sort of custodial financial organization holding an ass assets that might belong to me. Yep. And I'll break some laws. Yep. And the government knows where you are, and they know that you have my assets. Right. So in order for them to take your assets, they would need to go after both us and the Oracle. That's the point. And that's why we put the Oracle in jurisdictions where that's hard. And that's also a big advantage of the multiple oracle situation, because then they would need to spin oracles in three countries or however many oracles. But they can still freeze your assets. They can't. Right. They, they, can I raise my hand? Yes. They can still freeze things. They might not be able to take it. They can still freeze things. But same thing though. They would need to. They would need to. In order to freeze it, they need two of the keys, right? So they need Abra and the oracle. No, but if I wanted to take money out of Abra, again, if they get a hold of Abra. If they get a hold of Abra, um, they can, like, I won't be able to take my money out because yeah. they need both Abra and the Oracle. They won't be able to get it. Yeah, so that's why you, the Oracle's in these other jurisdictions, so it makes it harder for them, for governments to freeze, or a single government at least, to freeze the funds, right? Because they would need to get access to these entities in multiple countries. Uh, no, but uh, that doesn't make sense, though. So my money technically, uh, let's, to keep things simple, it's with Abra, or it's in this app. Mm -hmm. Or like a regular user, uh, he's just gonna be like, "Oh, I have this money inside this app that they know anything about the synthetic currencies backed by Bitcoin and right. those kinds of things." Uh, if I want to withdraw this money, um, and at the same time, it's uh, it's at that particular point in time that the government has some kind of probe into Abra, and uh, at that point, I'll, the user won't be able to actually withdraw the money. At that no, we provide methods for them to use the Oracle. Probably went through in some sort of open source thing that they can just download some oh, Python script. Okay. You can even always release private keys. Yeah. No, no, we don't even need to do that. Right? They just go through the Oracle. Okay. They, so you get the data off your phone that includes the keys and data and the transaction data, and you post that to the Oracle through the API that they provide. Question over here. Well, but when, when you cash out, you're sent, like, average send the, the USD somewhere, right? They send, like... Yes. Well, so the, our exchange partner does, yeah. Our banking partner. Your exchange partner. Because I'm basically thinking the U.S. could just freeze, like, your bank account. Like, yeah. That so if, if your bank's in the U.S., then yes, they can bank, freeze your bank account. But again, that's through our banking partners. Who are your U.S. banking partners? <laughs> <laughs> so we have more than one. I mean, do you want to elaborate? Or? No, no, we're not going to discuss that, and that's not going to be answered. Okay, yeah, that, that's not my department. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, wait, the microphone. Uh, what happens when the uh, app crashes? When our app crashes? Yeah. Uh, like, and it doesn't come back? <laughs> or what? Yeah, like, you look on the app. Well, so I mean, I guess you're talking about some sort of disaster scenario, and Amazon app crashes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, it doesn't that, from that so, so uh, there is a backup key which which uh, pr provides a backup phrase which provides access to all your keys. Um, one thing that, that we need do need to do is make it easier for users to access the data they need in order to uh, access their funds without error. What if this part is like the uh, synthetic currency, not Bitcoin? How does users retrieve that from their backup? Yeah, so we need to, so we do need to provide better tools for this, but it is possible, right? Because all of the keys and data needed to to access the, the the funds on your phone are in the app on your phone. Yeah. I you mentioned this was uh, to, to help globally. Yes. Uh, a sense of uh, what is the breakdown per country or, or jurisdiction that uh, your users Oh, you know, I'm not uh, totally up on the numbers, but we did start a remittance program in the Philippines, so we do have tons of users in the Philippines, 
And we do have users in most countries. Um, obviously, there's like English-speaking countries up more, probably just because of our parking material. Um, but if you want me, I can get back to you with, with more concrete numbers. Yep. Uh, so if you're buying, if you're buying, uh, if you're pulling in $100 and always getting $100 out only, then how are you getting exposure to any crypto products? Right, so $100, it, sorry if this was confusing, that was just an example of one synthetic currency. So we offer 50 fiat currencies, 25 or so cryptocurrencies, and we're adding more all the time. I guess to be more specific, like you're putting in X amount of value into the app, yeah. and you're not getting anything more than X or less than X. So what do you want to invest in? Like, say, sell Lumens. Lumens? Yeah. So you transfer $100 to your, to your app from your bank, and then you can convert it to Lumens. Now you have exposure to Lumens. But, so but I, can't, I can't withdraw those Lumens. Yeah, you can. Well, you can withdraw. So you can withdraw uh, fiat currencies, the two banks that support them, and when we have uh, um, native currencies, like eventually we'll bring Lumens native, and then you can withdraw them. So but what you do is you have the, you have access to the or you have exposure to the value of the Lumens. So if the Lumens go up, then you can convert them back to dollars and withdraw them to your bank, or you, or you can convert to Bitcoin and withdraw the Bitcoin. So, so from from the explanation that you had on like the first few slides, I was under the impression that if I withdraw it, then I'm always withdrawing it and getting the same dollar, whatever currency value back. Yeah, so sorry if that was confusing. So you can do different things. You can deposit and you can also exchange, right? So you could deposit. From a bank, you usually are using dollars and euros or something. So you deposit in that currency and then you exchange to the thing that you want um, exposure to. And then when you withdraw, you withdraw in whatever we support. Like it could be one of our native cryptos or it could be back to your bank in the original currency you deposited in. Thank you. So that's, yeah. a, that's a good question. So we actually had uh, users who, that's fine, it's, it's quite confusing. So uh, there are fiat currencies, there are also cryptocurrencies. So when you put $100 into the app and you keep it as USD, guess what? You put $100 in, it will stay at $100 based on the hedge. So if you put 100 USD, keep it as in your USD wallet, you're not going to gain magical exposure mm -hmm. to Bitcoin. Yeah. If you buy Bitcoin, that Bitcoin will stay the same number. Uh, so so I had that confusion when you showed the slide. Yeah. And I just signed up and I did the whole process and now it's actually with one computer. Let me just Okay. I think good thing to note, I will change my example. Use, <laughs> you can just use screenshots from your app. I literally did that one because I was so confused. I was like, if I'm gonna hold hundred dollars, that how do I profit? Now I get it like okay. Yeah. I yeah, hold the currency that I want to hold and I can quickly move whatever. But you can also hedge out, so yeah, you made it to the amount on Bitcoin. Switch back to USD, vice versa. So you, we just had an example with Lumens, and your exposure to Lumens, and if Lumens go up, you gain. But only if that partner of yours that's managing the Lumens is still in business. No. So the, the banking partner, the banking partners are just for transferring in and out. Right. The exchange no, no, your exchange. exchange. So the Lumen, Lumen goes to the moon. Yeah. Then. So uh, the exchange partner though only needs to deal with our with the currency that's backing the Lumens. So if Lumen goes to the moon, you're taking the risk, right? We're, but we're not actually taking risk because we because we hedge it. Yeah, but the question because we hedge it. What about your counterpart? We don't have a counterpart. Or you mean our lender? No, so we borrow Bitcoin, right. and then we exchange the Bitcoin for Lumens. Right. But you're not the custodian. Now, imagine your counterparty goes out of business. Yeah, but that's not their money. That's our our hedge. If your hedge, yeah. the, the counterparty in your hedge goes out of business. There is no Lumen counterparty though. It's Bitcoin. But you're not the custodian. Who's if I have 100 Lumen in my in my Albert, so, 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 yeah. so Albert is the counterparty, right? So for example, let's say you have a synthetic Lumen, right? We will hedge that by buying the Lumen. So the Lumen price goes up or goes down. We have Lumen. Always we have Lumen. We can always give it back to you when it goes wrong. Now your question is. Well, how, you know, what happens to Avaros, do there's something wrong? Yes, we, we do have to protect whatever crypto asset that we do to hedge the account for it. That is correct. Is that, that's your question? So, so if I have 100 limit in my wallet, Avaros has 100 limit in there in a wallet. I mean, that's that, the, that's in the a hardware simplest, wallet. Yeah, that's the simplest hedging strategy. That's not exactly what we do, but that would be the simplest way to understand it. Yeah, there's, a, there's lots of ways to hedge. This is just the basic way. 
question. First question is yep. uh, uh, back to oracles. So uh, if I persistently attack, uh, you know, your oracle network, will I slow down the uh, basically? So in, in the normal case, Abra and the user just do their business without the Oracle. The Oracle's just for these extreme cases, where the Abra wants to roll over without the user. Did, weren't you saying to, to Abra right, but it wouldn't slow down regular transactions, because in the, the normal transaction is just between the user and Abra. Which has two, for the yeah. price signature, the Abra price signature, so two, for, for the price, right? Yeah, so the, the Oracle and Abra don't have to use the same price seed. They just have to have good prices. Okay, and uh, and the second uh, um, the second question is, I use like that that's more like a product development or something. Um, so you effectively potentially you, you're running like a big exchange inside of Abra. Um, yeah, you can think of it as an exchange. It's a non-custodial exchange. Um, yeah. I would argue it's like basically a massive hot wallet, right? That, that has a lot of accounts. And, um, yeah, except it's not one wallet, right? Because they're spread across everyone's side. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you, you manage, you know, large. Um, have you thought of basically creating an uh, Abra, uh, Abra uh, bridge currency to, to, to help with? Uh, um, <laughs> like, yeah, we talked about this stuff with various opinions. Just that I thought about, about the, this problem is that you potentially can incentivize the, your, the, the users that you already have a lot of to a stake or lock in your, into, the, into your you know, wallet. Uh, you know, hence providing a lot of liquidity pool, big liquidity pool, and uh, through the tap, through the Abra token, having um, basically having the ability to to have a, a liquid enough uh, pool to, to to have exchanges and then distribute the, distribute the fees. Yeah, uh, it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> great idea. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, it, that is definitely an approach. Uh, Of the banks in 2008 with yeah. all the pokey derivative behind right. the scenes. Like poorly managed hedges. Exactly. Yeah. And so when you take someone's lumen, are you holding, so someone, let's say, 20 lumens, are you actually holding 20 lumens? So we're, so we're holding 20 lumens, but the user has an equivalent Bitcoin on their phone. So yes, if the price changes, it gets out of balance. But at any time, no, the, but literally, are you holding 20 limits? Yes, generally. I mean, not generally, but yes or no. Well, generally, because there's different ways to hedge, right? Like, if, you, if there was a working futures market for lumens, you could potentially use that. But in this model that I outlined, yes, we would be holding 20 lumens. But it's not the user's lumens. That's the important part. The user has 20 lumens worth of Bitcoin on their phone. So if, if, we, get, if we go bust, they just take their Bitcoin and Maybe if the hedge is out of sync for a little bit at that point, they're not completely whole, but they don't lose everything. But if, but if Lumens grows faster than Bitcoin, yeah, that's an issue. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why, we, that's why we adjust the hedges yeah. you know, periodically. But, but you're, so you're actually holding Lumens, and the user just has these batteries of Bitcoin. Backed by Lumens, yeah. So or Lumens backed by Bitcoin. So the risk is if you get hacked, you lose your crypto, just like a centralized exchange, right? No, because they have all this Bitcoin on their phone, equal to the value of their lumens. But I'm just curious, are you like a bank that has, when they buy, have their lumen, you take the little lumen? Well, so a bank out? holds customers' deposits, right? And we're not holding the customer's deposit. So where, so? So the, the customer doesn't own lumens, they own synthetic lumens, but they have the value of those lumens in Bitcoin on their phone. So we're not a bank. But if, but if you're actually holding some crypto, if you're holding crypto, okay, and yep. it all disappeared tomorrow. Then we'd be out of business, yes. And you're telling me that <laughs> all of your financial partners, everyone else is gonna uphold all of their contracts and pay everyone out in dollars. No, no, they would take it out in Bitcoin, probably. So the user, the user would go through the Oracle to take it out in Bitcoin. Our financial partners are just, are just, they're not, we don't have any exposure with them. They're just doing exchanges on behalf of the user which are pretty short-lived transactions, if you're where they're doing a bank transfer. If you're a user, I think your confusion is, you you own, you think you have exposure to 30 million, right? Yeah. And, and let me finish all of this. You have 
exposure to 30 lumen you're using. He holds 30 lumen so that he's, he's got it in balance. But what he has in balance is he's given you, you you've taken that first $100 and you have Bitcoin on your phone. And all he's doing is setting it up so that however much Bitcoin you have on your phone, he can convert into Lumen and not lose a dime. But he said he's got you. So, so if he but I'm not holding your Lumen. If he loses all his Lumen, yeah. you still have the Bitcoin on your phone. But, yeah, sure. But, what, but like, what, there must be some solvency problem. The problem yeah, is there has to be. It's very good. I mean, the, so, okay, there's, the question is, there, is there some sort of solvency problem? There is, there is, but it's short-lived, right? It only has to do with moves between when the last time the hedge was rebalanced. So, let's take this example again. Yeah. Myself, maybe everyone in the room, gets a bunch of synthetic lumen on the yeah. camera app. With, for Lumen goes up and up and up, and Bitcoin goes down and down and down. Yeah. Right. You're putting more and more Bitcoin on all of our phones. Where is all that Bitcoin coming from? Yeah. From our uh, the, uh, yeah. yeah. So you just get well, hey, we need more Bitcoin. We need more Bitcoin. Well, we need some more Bitcoin. No, no. So we so we sold our the Bitcoin we got from them for dollars, right? Or for Lumens in this case. Right. And so the. Uh, and so Bitcoin's going down and Lumens is going up. We have all this Lumen, so we start selling for Bitcoin. But, but we're not selling our lumen. No, but, no, but we have lumens. <laughs> I know, but I have still have the exact same amount of synthetic lumen on my phone. And you know, you're selling your lumen to give me more Bitcoin. Yeah. You're going to run out of lumen, and I'm still going to have synthetic lumen. Uh, no, so we don't run out. If we run out of lumen, uh, we only run out of lumen when the hedge is gone, right? So and we, but that would mean that, uh, that. I feel like I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah. Let's ask one question. I just have one yeah. question, guys. Uh, so, does the customer actually know that this is a synthetic position? Yeah, we make it clear. It, it's not like. Uh, I just want to ask that question. If, if it's clear from like, if you go onto the website and look at how it works, it's all. That would, because, like, if, if they think that they have boom, it's not actually there. The other key thing to, to realize is that we use this as a way to go live quickly. If it's a popular uh, asset, then we're, we're very motivated to make it uh, native. And so we build that into our app because we, there is there is hedging costs associated with the synthetic ones. So we'd rather users. I think users would rather have native assets. Let me add a point. The bigger picture here is that synthetic crypto is actually not that interesting. Okay, because you would be saying, well, why don't you just have normal crypto? Why do you have synthetic crypto? That's not the point. The point is not synthetic crypto. The point is going to be we can represent any asset synthetically on top of blockchain. Peer to peer, on top of crypto, to allow you to trade any assets in the world, global. That 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 is actually where it is. How is that better than a stellar token? It's not, but you don't necessarily have a stellar wallet, right? Like if you already are into stellar and have a stellar wallet, that's fine. But if you're just into trading tokens, you can just get Abra and you have access to every crypto. Good. Yeah. That covers me. All right, one more question. One more question. Oh, hold on a second. Does everybody understand what they heard tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still confused. Do you people not believe? Because <laughs> I need to know y'all got to believe. Because this is the future. <laughs> so the last question that's going to be asked here, it better be good. <laughs> Because we got 30 more minutes to hang out. So, who's got the last best question for Ish? I think it's Shot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, if everyone is, uh, if price of Lumen is going up and you're selling Bitcoin to buy Lumens, are you not aggravating the problem making Lumens go up even more? And We're selling uh, Lumens to buy Bitcoin. Uh, okay, aren't you? We okay, are selling Lumens to. By the coin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ish and Louie. I'm wrong. Thank you. That was